order the meeting of the Green Bay Traffic Bicycle and Pedestrian Commission for Monday, April 19th, 2021. Uh, we'll start with item B, roll call members, uh, chairperson keepers here. Vice Chairperson Thino. Here. Alderman Stevens. Here. Lieutenant Sobiak. Here. Uh, Commissioner Reardon. Bridget, are you aboard yet? Must not be here yet, so, but uh, let's go ahead and start the meeting. Move down to item C, approval of the agenda for Monday, April 19, 2021, Traffic Bicycle and Pedestrian Commission meeting agenda. I think uh, we'll just keep it in order. I don't have any request to move things around, so we'll just keep it in order that we have right now. Mr. Chairman, I would move C and D, the agenda and the minutes. D, is that what you mean? C and D. Okay, all right. Second. Most, motion to be made to approve item C and D. Do second. I hear a second? Ever? Aye. Aye. Okay. Motion Aye. To move down to item E, number one, general business. Report by the police department of the 2021 first quarter serious injuries and fatal crashes. Lieutenant, we'll turn it over to you with that one. Yeah, it's good to announce that the first quarter of 2021, we had no fatal accidents or severe uh, injury accidents within the city limits of Green Bay. And I believe that's countywide. They didn't have any fatals for the first quarter. And going back in stats, I don't think there's a recent year where they went to a quarter of a year without a fatality. So hopefully that holds true and we can go this year with fewer fatals than we've seen before. Very nice, that's a great report. We like that and throughout the city and the county. So um, thank you for your report. I'll make a motion to receive and place on file. Okay. And do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Second. Okay. Motion carries. Aye. Number two, initial requests. Consideration was possible action request by Gandrew Auto Group to remove the no parking zones on Auto Plaza Drive. Uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The, uh, there's a series of no parking signs on, um, on the roadway. In essence, they're there around a number of driveways. And it was our understanding that those were there to keep those driveways open for when vehicles were go coming in and out, uh, especially uh, you know, the larger trucks when they were loading and unloading larger vehicles. Um, I did have an extended conversation with the requester and they had stated that at the time there were actually two different auto groups uh, across the street. And I think they kind of had a little uh, falling out and I think some of it had to do with that as well. So, um, you know, the uh, need for the signs has certainly gone away. Um, and, you know, and it's, it's our understanding as well that the loading, unloading of vehicles from those vehicle carriers are actually, it's, it's all taken place in the curb lanes anyway of the roadway, which is acceptable by staff. So with that, staff really has no issues uh, with the request. So I have a five part recommendation that on a 90 day trial to remove no parking zones on Auto Plaza Drive at the following locations, east side from Auto Plaza Way from a point 140 feet south of Auto Plaza Way, East side from a point 215 feet south of Auto Plaza Way to a point 303 feet Auto Plaza Way. East side from a point south of Auto Plaza Way to a point 584 feet south of Auto Plaza Way. West side from a point 200 feet south of Auto Plaza Way to a point 275 feet south of Auto Plaza Way. West side from a point 440 feet south of Auto Plaza Way to a point 515 feet south of Auto Plaza Way. Uh, so moved. I'll second that. Motion to made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Motion carries. 
We want item three, initial request, consideration with possible action on the request for Alder Buffet to install a rectangular rapid flashing beacon pedestrian crossing system on East Shore Drive at the crosswalk connecting Bay Beach and Wildlife Sanctuary. Would you like me to go first? Uh, yeah, or, did, or do you want to go first, Alder Buffet? Or, um. I guess it doesn't matter in a way. Maybe I can explain a little bit. Um, we, yeah, maybe if you I've had different. Oh, I'm sorry. I've had different conversations with Dave and trying to figure out something. Um, you remember, was it last year or the year before that motorcycle accident that happened there? It was really bad. And if he hit a car that was pulling out and he went on the motorcycle and he crashed, but what if their pedestrians were crossing at that time? And I'm, I'm, you know, there are a lot of, from the Bay Beach, the sidewalk that comes over to East Shore Drive and you, you cross over into the wildlife sanctuary. Um, um, there's a, in the summer when the parks open and, you know, we're coming up May 1st, it's gonna open up again. So I'm really concerned. I'm surprised that we had some. I've seen some people are, are paying attention and they've actually stopped and let people cross. But um, that doesn't happen a lot. And we have a lot of speeding going on out here. I just think um, all the other things that I brought up with Dave, uh, he said just won't work, but I would like something. And this only operates uh, when there are people crossing. It's not like something that you have flashing or you know constantly. So uh, Dave can uh, come up more, more on that issue. Thank you. Okay, sure. Thank you, Alder Lafay. Thank you, Alder. Um, uh, the crosswalk itself, uh, it does exist and it connects the wildlife sanctuary to Bay Beach uh, Amusement Park. It, it is a ladder style crosswalk, meaning it's a high vis crosswalk, um, similar to what you, everyone probably recalls as the Abbey Road record from the Beatles, it looks similar to that. Um, it's signed with pedestrian warning signs and a down arrow. And uh, for RFBs, that is a rectangular rapid flashing beacon. It is a warning style device that is actuated when a pedestrian pushes a button on either side of the crosswalk and that initiates the flashing operation um, in a wigwag style pattern on each side of the roadway. So um, it's, a, it's a quite popular device when it comes down to uh, compliance. Um, however, these are uh, not to just be installed at any um, There def definitely needs to be some sort of a demonstrated issue, complaint, reports, uh, crash history, um, typically associated with a high volume of pedestrians crossing um, and ultimately a lack of motorist compliance to crosswalk laws that uh, enforcement and, and the police department have not been able to correct. Um, so with that said, um, and because there is a cost associated to it, I'm making a recommendation for um, this request to be referred to staff for study um, for uh, the feasibility of, of the RFB at this location. Yeah, I think they all, sorry. Go ahead, Alder. No, I think that would be good. Yeah, have staff study it. I know Dave a little bit about it's uh, by solar. I know on the north side, it should be okay. And I think on the other side, be up closer to the road, I think you might be okay with the solar. Um, that has to be checked too. But yeah, like I said, um, there are people who do not, people want to cross now. And there's a curve when they're coming from the east side going to the west, there's a curve kind of, and it's 25 and there's nobody, nobody does 25. And when they're traveling from the west to the east, um, so many people are driving along the curb. It's not marked as two lanes and people drive there all the time. And, and there's so much speeding. I live right across the street from it. So I see it all the time, the speeding and that. And I, I'm just, I don't want to wait till, till a kid gets hit. So, thank you. Okay, thanks, Alder. Do I, do I hear a motion to refer this item to staff? Don't move, Mr. Chairman. I'll second. Okay.
Motion make it all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries four initial requests. Consideration was possible action request by the, by the traffic engineer to establish parking zones in the rail yard district. Thank you, Chair. Um, as many of you know that the rail yard district is now open. Um, there are a handful of developments currently along its roadways um, and the, the roads have been recently or relatively recently dedicated back to the city of Green Bay, meaning that um, they're open to the public and the parking and traffic regulations now come back to the city. Um, that being said, I am requesting some restricted parking zones and to update the um, traffic regulations, say at some of the intersections along with it in order to preserve traffic safety and allow deliveries, move outs and similar uh, to what we have in our downtown area. So, I mean, this is a pretty long list of items. Um, I guess technically for the record, I should probably read them in. If, the, if everyone wants them approved, I do have a graphic that shows the, an overview of the rail yard development and it's color coded where these parking zones that I'm proposing would, would exist. So um, would that be okay if I share my screen, Chair? Yes, please. Okay. Is that something you need to do? I'm just right clicking on a few things here and I'm not, not finding much. Oh, here it is, sorry. I can share the time. I think that's just the, there we go. Let me just make sure I get this. Just give me one second here. Okay. There it is. So this is the overview map of rail yard. <clears throat> the north arrow points to the right. So you'll see Broadway listed here as US Highway 141. And this roadway here I'm showing is Kellogg Street, which runs east and west. Tease in at Donald Drive Away, which is a north south roadway. And then we, in essence, kind of have an elbow turn here where it turns into Bond Street. So, what you see in red is what is being proposed is no parking. And I guess when you look at it upon first glance, it looks like quite a bit. And the reason being is that a lot of the roadways were designed and constructed to be narrow. And the intention was that at that time and ultimately was to create a more pedestrian friendly environment, um, which as you can tell with the number of crosswalks that you can see throughout the, uh, the rail yard district. Um, so say, let's take for example, Kellogg Street, the entire segment would be you no know, parking this side of the street uh, on both sides. And similarly for, for Dye, um, right? The area that's green there is actually gonna be is being proposed as two hour parking, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday. A few stalls in there, but we still wanted to keep some opening, some visibility for the pedestrian crosswalks. And these are mid-block crosswalks. Uh, so, uh, you know, we want to make, make sure that there's plenty of uh, visibility for the motorists to see pending and, and crossing. But I've on street, you will see it's a, it is slightly wider in this area. And then on the north side, which actually we already have some development, some uh, apartments over here, and we're actually proposing a, a loading zone in this area. And, and again, I, I made a reference to downtown and, and how we handle a lot of uh, parking and loading and unloading next to some of the, uh, I'll call them mid-rise or high-rise apartment complexes, which um, exists right now on the north side of this location. So what we're trying to do is just get ahead of the curve um, before that really gets um, populated and, and potentially full. 
um, is, is to get that in and regulate that. And plus there's deliveries there currently anyway. So, um, you know, with, with the loading zone, it, uh, I think that'll um, work out quite well. So that in essence is what I'm proposing. I guess I'll get down to then the intersection control now that we're done with parking. Um, we'll start with this T intersection with Donald Driver and Kellogg. This is being proposed as a one-way stop. So Kellogg tees in to Donald Driver and then Donald Driver would have the free flow movement. And then the two intersections, uh, Bond Street here and Kellogg Street here with Broadway, currently now in our regulations book because this real, uh, both of these roadways teed in from the west. They were listed as one-way stops. We wanna convert those to two-way stops now since we have now east legs to those intersections. So uh, I guess before I go ahead and read my recommendations, does anyone have any questions on this? Uh, I only have one question, Mr. Chairman. Um, yep. uh, Dave, um, consider, considering the uh, adjacent businesses there, uh, do you feel that there's adequate parking that uh, uh, this would not affair, interfere with the uh, operation of those businesses? Uh, not only do I not think it's going to interfere with the business operation, of, um, but I was involved pretty much on the ground level uh, when it came down to rail yard, um, what the uh, proposed developments were, uh, its traffic impacts, et cetera. And um, I can tell you, it's not shown on this diagram, but I can tell you that um, there is a lot of parking that came along with this development. There's really a lot of it. Um, like you'll, you'll see some of these buildings here, but there is a lot lot of people. Um, and even over here, here at the title town, you know, this is all still parking available. There's going to be parking here. And as a matter of fact, that's why you have this mid block over here is that, you know, there are some, we want to have some consideration for these people that we're going to be crossing over um, to go to these various businesses and development. So to answer your question, Vice Chair, I, I do believe that as proposed with the restrictions, I think there's still gonna be ample parking. Okay, thank you. All right, do you wanna read in what you got then, Dave, for the record? So can vote yes, on it. yes. So on a 90 day trial, uh, we need to remove, so we need to start off the clean slate first. So there's some existing parking zones that are um, just north of Dallasman, and, and south of Kellogg Street, because basically that street just dead ended at one time. So we need to remove those parking zones. So on the east side of Donald Drive away from a point 290 feet north of Dallas Street to its north terminus, and on the west side of Donald Drive away from a point 310 feet north of Dallas Street to its north terminus, or I, we should really say it's former northern terminus. Um, and then on a 90 day trial, we need to establish following from both sides of Kellogg Street from Broadway to Donald Driver Way. On the east side of Donald Driver Way from a point 290, <coughs> excuse me, 290 feet north of Delsman Street to a point 285 feet north of Kellogg Street. On the west side of Donald Driver Way from a point 310 feet north of Delsman Street to a point 285 feet north of Kellogg Street. On both sides of Donald Driver Way from a point 370 feet south of Bond Street to Bond Street. On both sides of Bond Street from a point 70 feet west of Donald Driver Way to Donald Driver Way away on both sides of Bond Street from Broadway to a point 70 feet east of Broadway. Um, and now we're going to move on to the 30 minute loading. So on a 90 day trial, establish a no parking 30 minute loading zone on the north side of Bond Street from a point 70 feet west of Donald Driver Way to a point 140 feet west of Donald Driver Way. Um, and then two hour parking on 90 day trial, establish the following two our parking 7 a.m. 7 p.m. Monday through Friday zones on the north side of Bond Street from a point 70 feet east of Broadway to a point 350 feet east of Broadway on the south side of Bond Street from a point 70 feet east of Broadway to a point 420 feet east of Broadway on both sides of Donald Drive away from a point 285 feet north of Kellogg Street to a point 440 feet north of Kellogg Street and the intersection control items. So I'm not recommending these on a 90-day trial simply because 
Um, a, they've been in, and uh, B, I, I don't really think that there's a need to change anything at this point in time. I mean, you know, what would we be doing, you know, trying to go to a multi-way stop, let's just say at the, the T intersection, which um, the, the rail yard district really sees little to no traffic now, the way it is. Um, so I can just tell you from experience that when you come close to meeting a multi-way um, warrant on it. So that being said, following items are not recommend not, not recommended for 90 day trial, but rather to be adopted uh, right away by ordinance. So uh, first one is remove the one-way stop on Bond Street at Broadway and adopt by ordinance. Second one, establish a two-way stop condition on Bond Street at, and, at Broadway and adopt by ordinance. One, establish a one-way stop condition on Kellogg Street at Donald Drive away and adopt by ordinance. That concludes my recommendations. Oof. That was a lot. <laughs> it winded. I'll make a motion to approve as outlined. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Whatever I heard a motion. I saw a second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> motion carries. Thank goodness, Dave. Yes. Five, uh -huh. initial request, consideration of possible action on report by the police department and the traffic engineer with 2020-2021 adult crossing guard locations. Are you deferring to me then right away, Chair? Pardon me? Are you deferring to me then right away? Yes, yep. Okay. Um, just double checking to make sure that my screen is not being shared. I believe it is not, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, I guess what I, I'm gonna do is I'm going to, uh, Melanie Skamalski's on, on the meeting with us. Um, I'll unmute this and, um, or I'm asking to unmute actually, it looks like here. Uh, Melanie, I'm not sure if you wanna go first or if you want me to go first on this. We, um, we pretty much um, worked in conjunction on this item, um, but I guess as a precursor here, um, the way that, and I know there's some, some newer commissioners too that may have not have uh, been, been around when uh, some of this activity has taken place, but just to kind of get everyone up to speed, there's two things. Number one, um, historically, the request for additional crossing guards has gone through the uh, formerly called the Traffic Commission, now called the Traffic Bike and Ped Commission, um, for approval of additions, um, as well as usually taking in an annual report of just where are these locations. Um, and the other thing to, to be known is back in 2017, there was an agreement that was drafted and authorized, signed by the various agencies that split the duties of city-owned guards versus district-owned guards, that is school district guards. Um, because what was happening was the school district uh, was requesting guards. Uh, they were not being approved as city-issued guards and therefore they could see if there was some way that potentially they could staff particular intersections. So we did come to an agreement um, and to condense what the uh, provisions of that agreement are is that those requests come into uh, DPW traffic. Um, we review that and uh, make recommendations. And in essence, it's, it's an agreement between the district and public works. Um, and then if those, once we come to an agreement on those, um, then the Green Bay Police Department was training um, those teachers, it's basically who was, who was staffing these intersections, would, would train these teachers uh, on how to properly cross students. So fast forward now to, I believe it was late 2020, um, when um, the Green Bay Police Department, uh, because they managed um, the crossing guard program, uh, they had seen some changes. There was a retirement of the, their crossing guard administrator so uh, there was some shifting of, of, of people there. Um, and then there was a decision that they made to um, go out to see uh, if private parties that could manage and staff the program, which uh, there's a company called CrossSafe uh, that was uh, not only selected, but hired and, and approved. And uh, currently that um, is what is in place today. And uh, we do have uh, uh, Kevin Wark, 
and my Malinowski from the police department that uh, could probably address any questions or clarify anything that I said or maybe correct anything if I mistakenly stated anything about the program. Uh, but uh, with that being said, um, Melanie and I worked quite close together on some locations. Um, there were some changes uh, to some schools um, and at, because of that, were some requests for our staff to, uh, in essence, kind of re-engineer, determine uh, what activity is taking place at these intersections. And at some of these intersections, we had completed um, our hazard index evaluation for crossing ours. This is a, uh, a process, an engineering process that's been in place since actually 1964. Um, and has been, uh, was approved back then by council and we continued on with it because it's been a time tested and true uh, process. So that being said, I actually have a long list of the total intersections that are being staffed by um, the police department's uh, cross safe um, consultant or contractor. And I'm just gonna go through the ones there's really I believe it was five of them here that um, ones that were initially um, requested to be evaluated. And then there's some other ones that stuck out to us as we reviewed the list that uh, really should uh, not be staffed by a city guard. Um, and I'll explain those reasons. Uh, so the first one that we have, um, and this one was one just upon review, this was not a requested one, but um, the school is Beaumont, uh, which is an elementary school, and the intersection is Gross and Ninth. It's currently a two-way stop, uh, staffed in the morning and the p.m. Um, and this was a, a recommendation that's coming out of DPW, um, since we understand that there is a historically uh, little to no student crossings at that location. Um, but another important factor happened over the last year at this location uh, is that um, DPW upgraded that crossing to a uh, uh, RRFB, which um, as uh, Kathy, Alder Kathy Lefebvre was, um, her request came up. So I, I had a little explanation on that. Um, the reason we did that is that we actually had a flashing location at that um, spot. Um, it wasn't an RRFB, but it had, but we call them blinkered signs. So the perimeter lit up rather than having these rig rig bars. And, um, in essence, um, the location, we, we could not find replacement parts because the product was, was so old. So it was actually more cost effective to upgrade it to an RFP. So that's what we did. Um, so because of the low student crossing activity, plus now that we even actually have in place an RFB kind of by default, um, that, that would be my first recommendation. Um, and just so you know, I, I'd rather just go through this list and if anyone has any questions, it might, might be easier just to address them after. Um, second one would be uh, for Edison Preble, we have, which is middle, high, middle and high school students, uh, the intersection of Mason Alpine, which is signalized control. Uh, there's a morning and an afternoon guard. Um, and currently it sounds like there's a vacancy there. Now, this one, and, and, and I know, Matt Keepers, you actually may remember, because I know you were actually on traffic commission at the time. Um, there's two reasons I'm making this recommendation. Number one is that the city made a decision a long time ago that we were not to be staffing middle and high school crossings, which is why if you look at the district program now, that's they actually have some that are middle and high school. And it was just because you know they, they requested it. And we looked at it and said, uh, we didn't think it was going to necessarily hurt, but it wasn't something that, that we were willing to, to fund with, with city funds. Um, but the second reason, and again, this is going back uh, a number of years, going back probably three transportation directors ago at, at Green Bay Area Public Schools. Um, this location was identified at, by them at one time as a hazardous crossing, um, simply because it really had no pedestrian crossing features. There was uh, no crosswalks, things like that. Uh, signal was there though. Um, so what we did is we looked at this, evaluated it, and um, made a recommendation to have sidewalk installed between 
the, the there's one block to the north and basically one block to the south and it would connect into some other sidewalk networks and then we made improvements to the signalized intersection added some push buttons countdown timers uh made it ada compliant um it was a it was a pretty good job um and uh those are now in place um so you know that in in essence was our mitigated uh countermeasure to 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 uh the Green Bay Area Public School had brought forward, uh, and that was approved by Traffic Commission, and we went forward with that probably, I guess, six to eight years ago, um, probably even more. Than that. Yeah, um, that's the second location. Third is Eisenhower School Elementary, August at Lime Kiln, which is currently a two-way stop, staffed AM and PM. Uh, we went through and, and did a count at this location, both vehicles and students. Um, which had little to no students crossing. Um, it looked like we had three during one period, and I believe there's zero in the other. So um, the hazard index rate, just for clarity, it, it needs to calculate to 16 or greater. This one came up to 7.5 to nine. And the reason it varies is different peaks that we look at. So we look at it twice uh, during, during the, you know, once during the AM, once during the PM. Uh, so that one had a, uh, index rating that was almost half of what the requirement was. Uh, next, uh, would be Fort Howard, and that's elementary. Uh, Dells from Maple, not that we're looking at getting rid of the guard there per se, but there's two of them that were staffed there. And in talking with Melanie, it sounds like perhaps maybe two um, is not needed, but uh, could probably be handled with one. Um, so uh, we're fine with that at Public Works. Um, Franklin Middle. Um, there is a mid-block crosswalk at Lower Oneida, uh, PM only. Um, and this one, again, going back to the discussion uh, with Edison Preble, again, this is a middle school. So, um, you know, based off of our policy, city shouldn't be staffing those guards. And um, this one was actually approved early on as a district only staffing. So, not really sure what happened over the years, but sounds like one of our city crossing guards kind of ended up going over there for one of the two peaks. But uh, based off of that, uh, it, you know, and I remember that that crossing, I was there and actually built it and worked with the school to get certain appurtenances and features on their campus in order to accommodate this uh, mid-block crossing to make it a safe crossing. And, and they, they did so, and they did a good job at that. Um, how Elementary or St. Paul Lutheran, it looks like Chicago and Webster, there's two crossing guards. There's a question here on whether or not we really need two crossing guards. So and that's more of a recommendation by PD, but we'd be fine at Public Works uh, in that reduction. Um, Jackson School, Holy Family Elementary, uh, Fisk and Ninth, that's a signalized intersection, both AM and PM. Uh, when we did our study, uh, again, for both peaks, we encountered no students at all. Um, came up with a hazard index of 6.5 to 6.8. Um, so because, I mean, first and foremost, if you got no students crossing, I don't know what the need for a crossing guard would be. So that in and of itself should warrant the removal. Um, Fort Howard, Jefferson, uh, Ashland and Mather. Again, this is one where that was staffed for Jefferson and as, as many of you know, Jefferson Elementary no longer exists. Um, there is a Head Start uh, program that's at that location, but that's um, you know, it's young students. So everyone's either um, bussed in or they're, they're driven in by their... Um, so we don't see any activity there. So that one um, is being recommended for removal. All right, I think I got what, just four more. So bear with me, please. Preble High School. Uh, Dan's and Deckner. Um, I believe there's two of them there. Um, it's a one-way stop. And again, this is middle high school. Um, shouldn't be doing that. And this is also a location that uh, upon review was another one that we made as a recommendation for the school district to staff, but not city. So again, not really sure why this would be on, our, on the city's list. Um, and actually that is the next one, which there was two of them for some reason there. So same reason. So there's no reason to have two guards there or actually there shouldn't even be any. Uh, Sullivan Elementary, Deckner and Maine. This is one, a signalized intersection. 
uh, two peaks a.m. p.m. Uh, there were zero students that were crossing at this location. Uh, it does have a calculated hazard index of 10.2 to 10.7, uh, even with that zero in there, but there, again, there are no students crossing. And I know from uh, my knowledge of maintaining that signal that those are countdown site, um, timers uh, to enhance pet safety. And the last location is uh, for Tank Franklin. Again, we've got elementary and middle, which is uh, Mason 12th. It's a signal, AM, PM peak. I have a uh, hazard rating of 10.0 to 10.2. Um, again, shouldn't be staffing for uh, that location. Now, it, it, Tank is written down here, so it sounds like there may have been some, potentially some Tank elementary students. Now, in our observations, um, this location, there were two uh, what appeared younger people, which were presumed students. However, they didn't go to school. <laughs> they crossed the location, and then they actually headed westbound on, on Mason Street. So I don't know where they were going, but they weren't going to school. So um, all of this said, um, I guess if there's questions for me, I'll take them. I don't know if maybe it's a good time to maybe pass the torch to Melanie and then we have a, an overall discussion that that would be uh, your decision, Chair. Yeah, why don't you have Melanie, Chair, what she's got to share, Dave, probably. Back on, are you back on your, what you stated? Thank you. Uh, Dave covered a lot of it. We, I am the person that is the city person for the crossing guard administrator when Ken Broadhagen retired. So also on the call right now is Steve Sanis, who is the local supervisor for CrossSafe and then Commander Warwick. So um, through this transition time, we've been taking a look at our crossing guard program, seeing how our program compares to others, seeing if we need to make changes. It kind of seemed like a good time to do that. So. The way we came up with some of these intersections were through cross counts that we had our officers do. Um, if a cross safe crossing guard is not staffing a corner, we do use Green Bay PD officers or CSOs to have those uh, corners covered. We can't leave corners uncovered. So we kind of started with that. And then as well as Dave's historical knowledge with some conversations he's had in the past with the prior crossing guard administrator. Um, so he went over a lot of it and um, we'll probably continue to take a look at more intersections as we move forward in this along with CrossSafe and have those cross counts kind of guide where we want to go next and um, then obviously bring DPW involved to do the traffic studies and, and kind of have them get their technical knowledge um, to see if they would recommend a removal or not. Um, I don't know if I wanna, if Commander Warwick, if he wanted to say anything. No, I just really wanna thank and uh, show my our appreciation to Dave Hansen for providing those numbers, those recommendations and those traffic studies. Um, for, for the commission, I just want you to know that um, COVID has crippled the crossing guard program uh, since January 1st when CrossSafe took over. We have rebuilt the program, uh, and based on my evaluation, I don't know, or no one can at least tell me the last time that we've evaluated some of these intersections. It's got some excellent records as to what we've done in, in going forward, um, and you know, God only knows how we got to, to the point where we are today. So that being said, though, um, I hope the commission sees the, the work and the, the diligence that we put into uh, data behind these intersections and making the recommendations to the commission to ensure that we're operating the, the uh, crossing guard program as efficiently, cost effectively, uh, most importantly for the safety of all the children involved. So um, please know that we, we have got, we're reevaluating the whole program from top down. Steve Sands, who's the crossing guard administrator, has been great to work with um, and, and doing this. And we plan on, you know, once we have um, the decision tonight and then we go back and we look at other intersections we may come back and forth in front of you to determine what the next steps are um i can tell you from the police department's perspective um you know we we do our best and ensure that these intersections are staffed but we cannot maintain or sustain 
uh, the number of intersections that are currently in place. Uh, you know, when the officers are coming to me asking me why I'm standing on an intersection for zero or one to two kids, um, you know, it's hard to answer that question. All I can say is that's, that's the way we've always done it. To evaluate this program from top down to ensure that we're doing the best job we can. So um, please, please know we're, we're working hard. We're, we're doing the best we can. And most importantly, making sure we're providing that safety for every child that goes to school. Thank you. Uh, Steve, do you want to say anything? Uh, the only thing I'd like to comment on is that uh, the metal, uh, work that Melanie has, has done, uh, Officer Kevin and the, the whole police department has been very kind and very helpful with us. We are going to continue having our guards doing the counts through the end of the year, at least, because we feel that with COVID and the kids that are starting to come out uh, to go to school again, our counts may change during that period of time. So we plan on continuing doing the counts and can produce uh, reports at any point in time for you. Otherwise, we've really had a really great relationship with the police department. Uh, yeah, th okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm sure it's been a tough year with schools, kids not going to school and trying to figure out what's going on there. So a tough, a tough situation. So. Uh, Dave, what are you looking for from the committee then? A, a, you want us to refer it to, refer it to staff or what are you, what's, uh, what's your thoughts? And your, your um, request? Yeah, not to refer it to staff simply because we've already conducted the studies. There's no, re no reason okay. to do that. Rather, um, in the beginning, typically there needs to be action if there are additions being made because that simply is a, you know, it's a capital cost to the city, but seeing how we do not have any of that here, um, I'm simply looking for a receive in place on file this report and um, and just so that everyone's aware that, um, you know, unless we hear anything, other, we continue, we plan on continuing moving forward with the program with the removals as described today. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Anybody, any other comments from the commissioners? I make yes, a motion. Of... No, go ahead. Motion, I just sorry, Dan. Could... What was your motion, Dan? No, I think the lieutenant was going to oh. make a comment. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I make go a ahead. motion. I make a motion to file the report and make those removals based on the report. Okay. Motion was made. Do I hear a second? I'll second okay. that. I'll okay. make a, a comment, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this has been an enlightening conversation. I certainly think that uh, the motion is appropriate. I'm surprised at the number of unwarranted uh, crossing areas in the city. Uh, obviously, we're uh, using up a lot of city financial and, and uh, human resources uh, for no avail. I guess the other thing I'm surprised at is that uh, we are sending our police officers out to be crossing guards. That is, that is not the, um, and they have many, many other things to do. So this motion and the resulting action that uh, the motion will uh, facilitate is absolutely appropriate and the right thing to do for the city of Green Bay. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? That I, I heard a first and a second. So the, all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Okay. Motion carries. Thank you all for your work and effort on behalf of the crosswalk program. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's move on to uh, item six then, which was referred back from staff consideration of possible action on the request by Alderman Scannell to remove the truck route from North Broadway to McDonald Street between Mather and Alexander Streets. Dave, we'll throw it back to you with how you want to proceed here. Okay. Um, I am seeing as the list of participants on this meeting, um, absent from that is uh, Alder Scannell, who is the requester, Kilp, who um, was you know, the initial requester to the Alder. Um, but that being said, I do know that this was in essence motioned last meeting to basically table it for a month for some 
discussion to happen and to study this a little bit more in depth, which is what we have done. And I actually have a nine page memo that is prepared that I'm willing to summarize. I'm hoping quicker than rail yard, even though it's nine pages, but I think that there are some good points that need to be noted before uh, we open the floor and start having a discussion uh, relative to uh, this. So if that's the way you'd like to proceed, Chair, I can do that. Yes, please go ahead, Dave, with your... I'm gonna start it off with just an executive summary from the memo. I'm gonna read this verbatim and then I will, uh, in essence, talk through some of the highlights of the report. The request from Alder Scannell on behalf of constituent Bill Kilp, who lives in the Southeast corner of Broadway James, to move the truck route as noted, was discussed at the March TVPC meeting. Commissioner's motion to table the item until the April meeting in order to outreach or for outreach to occur to Brown County and potentially impacted residents and business owners. After studying both the existing and proposed truck routes, while acknowledging the feedback from stakeholders and considering the roadway characteristics along all affected roadways, Staff recommends that the truck route along North Broadway between Mather Street and Alexander Street remain as is for many reasons which are contained within this report, but primarily since the proposed reroute of the heavy truck route system to Mather, McDonald, and Alexander Streets would result in the inability to maintain two-way truck traffic due to truck sweat path turning movement conflicts with other vehicles, buildings, fences, and curb ramps. Um, so I did email out, I, I apologize on the tardiness, I um, put some finishing touches on this report today, but I did send it out to commissioners, and um, if you'll see, uh, I start right off the bat with some of the turning movement diagrams, and, and I don't know, do you, do you want me to share a screen again on this, Matt, this might uh, maybe, I guess, you know, make it more public that everyone's seeing the same thing? Yeah, I think if... You can as transparent as we can be here so everybody can see what you got. I think that's a good yeah, idea, Dave. Sure, I'll bring it up. There we are. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. All right, so I just read this executive summary. Now here are some of the turning movements. So this is, uh, basically going north to south on the proposed route. So this is uh, the, the intersection of uh, Broadway and Alexander, which tees into it. So we used a WB65 as the design vehicle, which is what we would use, what we would use for um, any truck route. So bottom line is that we need to maintain two way truck traffic on on our truck route system. And so what you can see here, when this black line here crosses over this red line, then in essence means that the trucks would collide. Um, and then you'll see this westbound and northbound truck is in essence clipping the corner of this, this building here. Now, remember this is when two trucks are coming at this location at the same time, because I'm sure the question would be asked, well, aren't trucks coming out of there right now? What are they doing now? Well, it's, it's not a truck route, so we don't have to make sure that there's that access. We have very low tra traffic. The traffic council will shortly show. Um, and you know, when some, let's just say something like this happens, you'll probably see a truck that's westbound. They'll probably back up a little bit and allow someone to come in and, and make that turning movement. But um, again, when, when you see the traffic numbers of trucks that would potentially be rerouted, you'll see that there's going to be, or would be a, a, a pretty good flow of, of trucks and this, this kind of behavior, uh, driver behavior would not be acceptable. Um, so anyway, there's the first intersection, you can second one along the route at McDonald Alexander. Again, the two trucks would collide. There's a fence really tight on this corner. We'll get uh, in essence clipped. Uh, this one is McDonald now. Other, see there's um, vehicles here kind of parking on this corner that will get clipped and even the corner. Um, and I haven't mentioned curb ramps yet. You know, there's pedestrian facilities at some of these intersections. And, you know, if there was a pedestrian sitting there, obviously that would not have a very positive result by any means. 
Um, and here's the last one that's at uh, Broadway and Mather. So again, you can see this curb ramp is, is being obstructed and then that the two paths do, do collide. Next, I looked into uh, the traffic count. So um, I know that some of you have seen this diagram before. This is basically what Federal Highways, uh, how they categorize all vehicles. So there's 13 classifications of vehicles. Now, the reason I wanna mention this is that I know that there was a study done in the past relative to heavy trucks and semis. So that, that study was actually slightly different in, in that we were simply only looking at semi trucks and greater. So I believe it was just a class eight or greater on the, on the prior study. Now, when with the request, you're looking at a whole reroute of the truck route system. So that would actually be a class four and above. So you're talking about more, more vehicles being rerouted. So as you can tell, your passenger vehicles, motorcycles, uh, you know, single unit kind of vehicles that are under 10,000 pounds uh, would still be able to go on the existing route between Mather and Alexander on both Broadway. Everything else would be forced on to, uh, to Mather and McDonald and to Alexander. Um, here are the counts. Uh, I'm not going to bother you too much with the details, but just showing you that I summarized here. If you look at the first line that says cycles, cars, SU, that's for single unit, that's classes one through three. And then trucks and semis, that'd be the rest of them, uh, which is what I just showed you on the prior diagram. So, so this is this first segment here, Broadway, Mather to James. Uh, during the weekday, you got 22% trucks. So almost a quarter of that traffic is actually truck traffic. Um, and on the weekends, then it actually goes down between 11 and 14%. Um, now you can see on the reroute area, so this one, right, well, this is Broadway between Augusta and North Rail Cross, and you'll see these numbers are lower. Now those percentages are but they're lower. And you probably are asking, well, why would it be that much lower? Um, well, number one, the, the car traffic or vehicle traffic is almost half, and that just means that a lot of those cars that are coming through are going into those neighborhoods, like on James Street and uh, <clears throat> Augusta. Uh, the trucks are also lower, um, not necessarily half, but it looks like it, during the weekday, you're looking at 200 to 250 versus in the lower segment, it's more like 360 to 380. So that simply means that there's probably a trip generator, a truck trip generator somewhere in that segment, which is true. Um, K and K uh, integrated logistics is actually located at Phoebe street. So that would explain why you have a drop in trucks south of there, and I'll get to them later because that, that actually plays a significant part of this study. Um, and then these last few here, this would actually be on the truck route or on the proposed alternate truck route or reroute. So you'll see right now, you know, you have about the same percentages during the week, 20, you know, 26, so basically 25 to 30% here and five to 10% on the weekends. Now this segment that's McDonald Street, just north of James, you really do see a significant drop off in trucks and that leads me to the trucks that are coming in and immediately going into uh, the business that is uh, immediately across from James Street. So they're really not even traversing north of James. Um, and then brought um, this Alexander Street Broadway to McDonald. Um, that would be just right around the corner there. So you can see again, you know, these, these trucks here and vehicles. So this right here just shows you where the count locations are taken. These are identical summaries of all the traffic counts. I just wanted to put this in the report just because those numbers are somewhat hard to read. So I wanted to have both of them in there. Um, now I do, we did get some responses back from businesses. Um, I do see some of the uh, names that are in my re report that are actually in the gallery tonight and I'm presuming would like to speak. Um, but I will just summarize. I don't want to have to go through all these. I'm sure you're going to hear some of these from them, but um, I do have a Tom Madsen, owner of Madsen, um, who is opposed for seven different reasons. Uh, some of them are similar to what I've uh, already concluded. Um, Todd Christian, he is from KK Integrated Logistics, uh, again, confirming that they have a facility uh, on North Broadway between Mather and Alexander. Uh, and they were inquiring um, how a truck route change would impact their business ops. and 
requested to participate tonight's meeting, which I believe um, Todd is online here. And then Ed Tadulin was a plant manager at Grayma there on McDonald Street, right at, at, at Fort. Um, they do have uh, some concerns in that uh, they actually have staff that crosses McDonald Street multiple times in a day. And in essence, what they're, they're saying is that if this reassignment of the truck route would happen, that they'd be formally requesting a legally signed crosswalk um, to their facilities or be, uh, between their facilities. One thing I want to note is that legal crosswalks require connections to sidewalks, of which none are present at this location. This means that a sidewalk study would be required and that if sidewalks are recommended, then the adjacent property owner is assessed for the cost. Again, you know, we're opening up kind of a whole other can of worms here. Um, so here are my conclusions. Um, I just really, I, I got a lot of them here. And I don't want to have time, but I think I'll just kind of just highlight these real briefly. First and foremost, um, as I have already stated, and that's why it's the number one reason on here, is because of the truck turning templates that we superimposed on those intersections, two semis cannot pass each other without uh, conflict with either the trucks themselves or other items uh, nearby the road features, such as buildings, curb ramps fences, etc. cetera. Um, let's see, we also have, uh, yeah, I just wanted to add this and I kind of alluded to this under the current situation, but if truck drivers are forced to take each corner one at a time, then opposing movements throughput would be halted. And if a trucker stop, that is stopped, would back up to let this opposing truck make a safe turn. There's a much higher probability now, or I should say, in the future, if this was approved, that they could, that this backup that would occur, that they could actually, you know, potentially back up into the front of a, another vehicle, which obviously is not safe um, at all. Um, we have, uh, we, we talked about noise levels, and, and this is something that I think, you know, should be noted because this is a, a quality of life issue that was brought up by Bill Kilp and you know, I guess, you know, living at a location where he does, I, I can completely empathize with this, uh, with this point. So that being said, removing the trucks from that segment would and should decrease truck traffic and the noise levels that come with that. Um, now note that the noise levels may increase at the intersections that were introduced in turns and stops. So Broadway Mather would be one, Broadway Alexander um, as well. Um, now, seeing how we're taking one location or would be taking one location and improving it, what you're really doing is you're pushing um, that concern, the truck traffic and the noise levels onto other streets. So it would be the ones that are being proposed, Mather, McDonald and Alexander, all would, would see more truck traffic and, and higher noise. Now that being said, looking at those traffic numbers, if trucker compliance is 100%, then that would be about 370 trucks, uh, less those doesn't do or coming from K&K &K and others, see item 17 I have a note on, uh, would be rerouted to Mather, McDonald, Alexander on the weekdays between 90 and 130 trucks on the weekends. Um, next point um, is pavement failure. Although we've got similar pavement structures uh, on both the existing truck route and the proposed truck route, there's one segment of concern which had a payment rating of four, a pastor rating of four. And that would be between James, on McDonald Street, between James and Railroad Crossing. And this figure five is just one of many pictures I took that shows the damage already on this roadway. So obviously adding you know, those 370 trucks per day, et cetera, on a constant daily basis that the ESO loading is going to it's certainly not going to improve this. It's going to it's going to make it uh, deteriorate at a faster rate, um, and obviously then the city would be asked to repair it. Um, I guess two points that were brought up at the last meeting was that the county uh, do have oversized overweight truck routes that use James Street, which is within the segment being uh, requested for removal. Uh, they also have uh, a high clearance truck route uh, that also uses that same route. 
Now, that being said, um, you know, we've worked with the county on that, but, you know, whatever happens tonight really doesn't uh, change what they do um, because that's their approved route. So um, if that's their approved routes, that's the way that they're going to continue to go. Um, I already talked about the multiple stops. Um, I guess I want to think they really, you know, we talked about the noise and, and the turns, et cetera, but also think about the addition of uh, fuel consumption and the environmental impacts uh, that would happen because of the uh, addition uh, of the length of the route, and, which is to my next point. The reroute segment is actually, I, I calculated the distance, it's 2,905 feet. And without the reroute, it's 1,640. So that difference is 1,265 feet or about a quarter mile. So in essence, you're adding a quarter mile to the truck route. Um, just a few more points here and I will be done. Um, we talked last time about sending traffic past the new community shelter, uh, which has uh, you know the vehicle pads uh, that are at that location and there's drop-offs, uh, et cetera, that occur at that location. Um, another thing to point, this is not engineering, but um, I was uh, noted and privy to this information, which really is public information, um, because I was, uh, I was accosted by a reporter from NBC26, which basically wanted to find out some information about this. So I went to their, their Facebook page and found uh, that they had done a story. Um, I was not interviewed for this story. So, um, you know, I, a lot of it was um, the requesters um, that, that commented on it. However, when I went to the, the social media page, uh, this was on March 22nd, by the way, um, I found 302 comments and 48 shares to that. So kind of a popular story that they had. And in perusing the comments um, was highly favored against uh, this traffic reroute. Um, I'm not, I wasn't, you know, I don't, I'm an engineer. It's not really my duty. I just figured that since I came across this, I should make you aware of that. Um, again, I talked about the businesses impacted. Um, I added about the additions to turns. One thing we haven't talked about yet is railroad crossings. Um, <clears throat> adding or going on to this reroute, actually there's two separate crossings versus on the existing route, there's one. On the existing route, we actually have gates. So it's an improved crossing. On the proposed route, it's actually two separate crossings uh, that are unimproved, no gates, which has yield and stop signs at them. So again, you're adding uh, more stops, braking, et cetera, uh, for the truck traffic. Um, we talked about stops. We're gonna be adding two one-way stop conditions. Uh, because as you're going southbound on the truck route, you'd have to stop at Broadway and Mather, and vice versa, going northbound, you'd have to stop on Alexander at Broadway. So two, two additional stops there. Um, one thing I haven't talked about here yet is intersection site distance at Alexander. Um, I don't have a picture of it here, but when driving it, the building is tight on the intersection. So if you're a truck driver and you're looking for gaps, it can be difficult. Now, can you see it? Yes, but I think that it's limited. And because trucks have slow acceleration, I think it could become an issue. Um, I talked about K&K um, on Phoebe Street. So just knowing that, let's just presume that this goes through and it is changed, you are not going to eliminate truck traffic in that area. Uh, as we cannot deny K&K integrated logistics access to Broadway because that they still would be compliant with our heavy truck ordinance, which allows uh, origins and destinations that have truck traffic to be able to take the shortest, most practicable path off of a truck route. Uh, the other thing to think about too is uh, any of the municipal, county, and state vehicles, uh, city buses, um, uh, school buses are exempt uh, on that from that same ordinance. Um, so you know you're still going to see dump trucks from Public Works, uh, Parks Department, which actually has a, a shop real close by, uh, delivery trucks, FedEx, all that, you're still gonna see them. Um, uh, my last point, and I think this is one that it kind of came up, but again, this is something that I know commissioners that have been on, on the commission for a while, probably remember back about 10 years ago, 
Um, we did a citywide evaluation of removing traffic signals. And I know that some recent discussions we brought this up. Well, Broadway and Mather used to be signalized and it's now a two-way stop. It's been working very well as a two-way stop. Um, but if we rerouted traffic, uh, I do have a concern that um, if this is as significant as a, is if we get this 100% compliance, that we potentially might be looking at reinstalling that traffic signal, which by you know just using planning estimates would be uh, about 200 to $225,000 to furnish. So that being said, um, that really concludes my study. And I guess, I, I don't know where we wanna go, Matt, on this. Um, if you want to uh, take questions till the end, or if uh, you want me to answer questions on the, the report now, open up the floor, uh, that would be your choice. Okay. I stepped away for a second, Dave. So you completed and were we ready to open the floor up then? That, yeah, that would, that's your decision. Then yes, I'd be fine. Do you have anything else you want to add before we open the floor up to interested parties? No. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I entertain a motion to open the floor up to interested parties to speak to this item. I'll make a motion to open the floor. Second. Do I hear a second. Motion made second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we will open the floor up. I don't know, is there an order or how many, I can't tell how many people speak to it. Dave or Matt, can you tell, or how do we wanna start? Yes, um, well, I do see Cole Rungi from Brown County Planning. Um, I do see him uh, on the call here. Um, I also see Ed Tadulin and Todd Christian on the call who are um, um, associated with businesses in the every route. Okay. Um, why don't we pick one of them to start with, Dave? And you, do you need their information, or do you have their names and addresses, or would you need that at this point? Um, I, I mean, we have the names obviously here on the Zoom meeting. Addresses, uh, their business addresses would be fine. So as we ask them to participate, um, we just ask for their uh, their name, spell it for the record, and then to provide uh, their address, business address is acceptable. I would say probably listening to what they have to say and then probably maybe closing it out with uh, Cole Rungi from planning to get his perspective. Okay, all right. Uh, why don't you pick one of them to go then, Dave, whoever, I can't see both of us. I'll, I'll go with Ed. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, good evening, uh, gentlemen, and uh, good, good evening, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Dave, for inviting me to listen to this uh, meeting. I represented uh, Graymont here, and uh, our plant is uh, situated on the east side of uh, McDonald Street. But opposite that street, uh, we have our warehouse, we have a, a fuel depot, and a maintenance shop. So we purposely crossed that street just to get uh, parts uh, to refuel our, uh, our vehicles and uh, to do maintenance job. And uh, that, that, that would uh, like uh, create a hazard to our guys uh, who are either on foot or uh, driving a vehicle. Uh, some vehicles are small as uh, a golf cart or as huge as a payloader because our fuel depot is on the west side of, uh, of the McDonald Street. So our concern is uh, if uh, the trucks will be rerouted from, from uh, McDonald's and going through, uh, the, through, through our plant, uh, our, our guys will be uh, uh, like in a disadvantaged position because we cross that street uh, every single day. That's my concern. Okay, thank you, sir. Next speaker. Can I ask, can I interject real quick? Um, we did not get an address from Ed Tedulin. Uh Yes, our address is 137 James Street, corner of James and uh, McDonald Street, Thank Green you. Bay. 
Okay, thank you. And who was the other party, Dave? I, I don't have them. That would be Todd Christian from KK Integrated okay. Logistics. Todd, if you want to go ahead and speak and sure your address, uh, please. Good after good afternoon, everybody. Um, <clears throat> thank you for allowing us to speak tonight. Um, plus, I want to thank Dave for the conversations that we've had uh, recently regarding this. Um, so I'm the director of operations with KK Integrated Logistics, and the address is 305 Phoebe Street. Um, <clears throat> as Dave alluded to, um, you know, we have trucking operations um, daily from approximately 6, 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, there are also typically Saturdays that we, we deliver. Uh, we do local shuttle trucking for our customers in Green Bay. And we also have over the road drivers coming in to deliver product to our warehouse. Um, we're probably talking 30 to 40 trucks a day um, that bring product in and out of our warehouse. So, you know, there's, there's a good amount of traffic that is still going to be on that roadway. Um, the other option that we, we need to keep open too is we do work with the port. So northbound on Broadway, we need to have access access to the port because in the past we have had deliveries from the port to our warehouse on Phoebe Street. So, you know, if that truck route is changed, you know, potentially it, it could change that that option we have. So we just want to make sure that we're able to access the port and we're able to continue, you know, obviously with our trucking operation, um, you know, because we don't want to affect that for our customers. Okay, thank you, sir. I think you said there were two parties to speak, Dave, and then you wanted to finish up with Cole Rungi. Is that correct? Um, actually, um, the two have already spoken, and, and we can have Cole speak next. I just wanted to respond to one question that uh, Todd had, and that was relative to he just wants to preserve access between the port and his facilities regardless of what would happen if it was rerouted or not. Again, coordinates, uh, as long as those routes are on the shortest path between the port and your facilities, they would be legal. So uh, really no, no change in operation. So, um, but hopefully that answers your question. And um, with that, then um, I think, uh, I believe Cole is available to speak. Yes, go ahead, Cole. Okay, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for having me here tonight. Um, Brown County Planning Director Cole Rungi. Um, our address at the office is 305 East Walnut Street in Green Bay. Um, I'll start by saying that I agree with, with staff's recommendation not to remove trucks from that portion of Broadway. Uh, I think Dave covered the issue very thoroughly um, a couple things I would add um, include um, as the port grows, um, I only see truck trips increasing in that area. Um, I think it's important to maintain that efficient connection all the way through there. Again, Dave covered a lot of the reasons why those connect, that connection needs to re remain in place. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about something Dave mentioned, which is the oversized overweight truck routes we put together. Um, we put those together in about 2017. And, and we did work with city staff and other jurisdictions throughout our area. And, and the idea was to make sure that over time that the port had routes in and out of the area to be able to transport and receive those large loads. And so when we established those by code or anything, it, it's basically a cooperative effort between the county, specifically the port and the affected jurisdictions to make sure those routes are clear for those oversight. So basically the area you're discussing tonight is one of our um, incoming and outgoing routes for oversized overweight loads, not the overheight ones, but the oversized overweight loads to get between the port's north terminal and Interstate 43. So I guess one of my concerns would be if you were to remove trucks from that portion of Broadway and those loads had to be taken out and brought in 
from I-43 via a different route, the other most viable connection we would be looking at would be uh, Mather Street, and that creates its own issues. So I believe if you have to choose one of those two routes, the Broadway route that exists today is, is by far the best route to get those large trucks and those large loads to and from that north terminal at the port. So, um, so again, I, 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 I support Dave's recommendation uh, for the reasons he's mentioned, in addition to the reasons I've talked about here. Okay, thank you. I see a, is that a finger or a hand up, Alder LaFay, Julie? Yes, um, I can hear Dave. Uh, they are talking about, you know, moving the coal piles and developing the former Pullian plant, more of the hub for the harbor. Would that change things at all with the flow, you know, for the trucks? Um, kind of like what Cole was talking about that uh, as the port grows and, you know, like if you're saying it, presuming that that's an expansion area, um, of course, yes, I would see truck traffic not only being increased, but, um, you know, the safety issues that I brought up would just be amplified uh, on that reroute. So um, it definitely, I mean, I don't know what the status is of that. I know it's been somewhat uh, tossed around by uh, agencies and people outside of my circle, um, but um, it, it certainly would have, I, I guess, a negative impact if the reroute was approved. I can I can uh, say something. I think that probably will be a little few years down the road because there's a lot of logistics uh, still to work out with all that. But this is something I think yeah that should be in the mix to think about. If if I could add to that, Mr. Chair. Sure. So yeah, the county's intention is to purchase a portion of the former Pulliam site. Um, there's a chance the coal piles could be located there, but as the older person says, that could take some time to, to work out if it, if it occurs. The county's main purpose in doing that is to facilitate port growth. Now, that could include uh, moving the coal piles up there in the future. If that doesn't happen, um, we'd be seeking other tenants up there, and there's a good chance that those tenants will be moving commodities in and out of the area via truck, at least in part, uh, even though there will be a rail component to it, um, we, we expect truck traffic as that development occurs up there to grow. Um, we're also um, already, we know that an existing tenant intends to purchase a portion of that site as well uh, to expand its operation up there. So again, we're, we're trying to really do all we can to grow the ports over the next several years. And with that growth, we expect um, additional truck trips to occur. So having that route in place is critical to that growth. Can I make one, one thing? Uh, I don't know if the people on the commission know that I'm also a Brown County supervisor. So, so I got a dual role. And so I kind of know a little bit on both sides what's happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for sharing. Um, do we have any other interested parties or have we anybody that wishes to speak to this item has, has had their time to lot it there, Dave? So we're good to go back to regular Correct. business. Yeah, I, I, I'm looking, it looks like we have 10 participants and everyone that I see here uh, that wants to speak, uh, most likely has spoken unless there's more feedback, of course, from um, the commissioners. The other thing is, too, is we need to officially close the floor. Yeah, Chair, let's, let's make a motion to close the floor. Okay, second. motion to go back to regular business. Do I hear a second? Second. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we're back to regular business then. So, uh, all right, Dave, we, what were you saying? I'm sorry. Uh, all I was saying is that if there's you now commissioners that, uh, you know, I, this discussion and if you have questions on my study or whatever, I'm, I'm more than willing to answer any questions. Any questions from the commissioners? Our Lieutenant, no, okay, all right. Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead, Dan. Um, I would, I would um, 
move the recommendation of the traffic engineer to deny the request to move truck route from North Broadway to McDonald Street between Mather and Alexander Street. I, I think we all sympathize with people in the neighborhood with their concern about noise, pollution, what have you. But after listening to all of the evidence here tonight, uh, I just don't see where we have an alternative that is practicable uh, to solve any issues that do exist. So that would be my motion, Mr. Chairman. Okay, we've had a motion. Do I hear a second to the motion? I second. Name? Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Okay, motion carries. Looks like unanimous. So that will take care of item six. Thank you for your report, Dave, your time and efforts, and all the parties who spoke to that item. Thank you. Most welcome. So let's move on to well, we're on item seven, which is the start of termination of 90 day trial. I'll let you, Dave, seven through 11, I'll let you kind of break them out how you want there for approval. Sure, thank you. Um, first item, E7, which is removing the no parking zone on the west side of 12th Avenue from Clinton to a point 110 feet south of Mason. Um, from what I understand, uh, everything is working fine. I, I do believe that, um, I don't know if it was the business, I think it was the business on the corner had some questions, which um, I simply forwarded off to Alderman Brian Johnson um, because really it was more of a, I don't wanna call it a neighborhood issue, but I mean, I really did not have any sort of, I mean, my, my position did not change. I, I supported the, the request, if, if anything, it made uh, the operations by the signal safer. So uh, I, I'm making a recommendation for that item to be moved forward. Uh, well, actually it's not being moved forward to ordinance. It's just a removal from the ordinance. Item uh, eight, eight, to establish a no parking zone on the west side of uh, 12th F from third to Clint. Oh, that's what I was, sorry. It was a shorter zone and now we're taking the whole block. So yeah, I'd, everything still pertains. Um, okay. Certainly uh, uh, approve of that. Uh, E9, remove the two hours, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday to Friday parking zone on the east side of Broadway from a point 430 feet south of 3rd Street to a point 90 feet south of 3rd Street. Uh, again, no issues on this one. I uh, have not heard back from the elder either, uh, but it was their request. So uh, no news is good news. I will make a recommendation to move that forward as well, just removing it from the ordinance. And it looks like 11 is another removal. Uh, well, it's, it's all in the same area. So um, removing the tour seven to seven Monday to Friday parking on the east side of Broadway from 32 to a point 60 feet south of Clinton. And then E11, again, same thing. Uh, establishing, just going ahead and, and reestablishing the zone as, as requested, two hours seven to seven Monday to Friday parking. Uh, east side of Broadway from Mason to a point sixty feet south of Clinton Street. So, all of can go ahead and make one motion, one second, and approval for all five of them. Okay, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, we've got items seven through eleven approved. F informational next meeting Monday, May 17th. Um, I don't think we have anything under public hearing. Anybody have anything else to add to the cause tonight? If not, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Okay, motion been made to adjourn and second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries. We're adjourned. Be safe and we'll see you all in a month.